Hello and welcome to the TOA 16 uh, studio. My name is Karsten Lem. I'm a senior editor with Wired Germany. And I'm here with uh, Serkan Piantino, um, former founder of the AI research at, uh, lab at Facebook. And we're uh, talking about artificial intelligence, which seems to be everywhere these days. Indeed. What it seems like you just talked about this. Um, you know, you can recognize people in images, you can do all kinds of things, of course, self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. What is it actually that, that AI these days cannot do? Ooh, well, I think uh, artificial intelligence is a pretty broad term. So I think one way that I put it is that we have a lot of specialized AI systems, things that can do a very specialized task like driving a car mm -hmm. or understanding uh, you know, a visual scene or something like that. And we don't have very much. In fact, I'm not even sure that we have a plan to creating uh, general AI systems, things that think like a human being uh, would and generally understand the world around them. Things like even common sense still elude computers today. So um, I, I usually bring that up in the context of alleviating people's fears about <laughs> uh, AI. And I think uh, it's unfortunate that the term comes with uh, so much of that sort of general baked in fear of the machines taking over. What we have now are special systems that can do things that previously only humans can do. Now we can do with computers. Uh, but among those things are not you know, creativity, uh, rational thought, you know, the things that we would put in the bucket of general human intelligence. Well, you just showed uh, a computer essentially imitating Shakespeare that mm. counts as creativity. But no? like you but said, imitating. Mm -hmm. You know, the, does the, I don't think the computer, you know, feels the depth of emotion that William Shakespeare felt or whoever actually wrote that stuff. I guess it's controversial. Do, do you think that's going to come, that machines will actually develop a sense of self? I think it's, do I think it's going to come? Yes. But I think that's the part of me that is a philosopher and thinks in the grandest scales about human beings, um, I don't think that uh, that is imminent. And I don't think about that as a scientist. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I've never had any of my networks crawl out of GPUs and um, you know, sort of ask me why they were created. Those types of things are, uh, I think, are still science fiction. What are near term the biggest challenges in this field? So there's a lot of different answers to that. It's actually a really interesting question. The, the sort of like where all of the um, untapped potential there's so, it's such a broad domain. There's so many different things that uh, we can try. I think people will give you different answers as to where they see the sort of next, the next thing going. Uh, I think there's a general consensus that right now, uh, the way we train these networks is in what we call supervised fashion. So you have labels, you have data that tells you the right answer. And uh, you show a network a bunch of questions, you give it the right answer many, many, many times. And eventually it understands uh, what is going on and it can do the task you've given it. But the real question is what if there is no right answer? You know, how, what does it mean to just understand the world and build a more sophisticated representation of what's happening in the world where um, without a specific task or a specific set of labels. We call that unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, that is, if there were one thing I would say that that is the, the nut yet to be cracked, I would say unsupervised learning is the most commonly cited one. It took a long, long time for AI, 60 years actually, almost mm -hmm. to the day now since this, uh, the, f the first conference about this was held in, in at Dartmouth College. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it took a long time to fulfill the promises that people then thought were imminent. What, what was it that, f you know, was always uh, in the way? Why did we have several AI winters even mm. that people talk about? And suddenly we're seeing this enormous burst of activity and successes. Yes. Uh, this is something I think that this is a really important question. Um, I think, and you know, I'm relatively new to the field, so uh, I understand these AI winters and I've, I've seen this sort of history of them. I didn't live through one. Mm -hmm. But my understanding and seeing what's happening now is that, uh, especially for research domains when they are promising, and, and the stuff that's happening in machine learning and AI is very promising, not only because we can do new things, but also because we're learning about what structures learn and we're seeing analogs between the things that work in machine learning and the way those things map to structures in the brain, and that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. But in any research domain, it's difficult to explain these advances to the public. And I think as much promise as there can be in a field, there's no ceiling to how much the expectations or the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, 
press and all the public perception of things, you know, the, those expectations can grow faster than mm -hmm. scientists can actually uh, innovate in those fields. So you worry about that. You worry about something in AI. You worry about how quickly people's minds can run away from them, how different people's perceptions of what is happening in the field are from the reality. And, um, and I think that's what can create these mismatched, mismatched expectations and subsequently, you know, disappointment, lack of mm -hmm. investment, that type of thing. But I, I think, I don't think we're there yet. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and also my understanding is that initially scientists uh, tried to kind of put the world into rules and program that yes. into the computer. These days we're more at systems that learn themselves like a child. How old yeah. would you say the computer child oh. is right now? Well, the computer child is very, very young, but mm -hmm. very good at one thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not much like any child that you've ever met. But uh, yeah, I would say that the, in the past there were um, the approaches that people used to uh, to do AI were more symbolic, logic driven. They were about you know sort of manipulating concrete symbols, understanding rules of inference. You know how sort of more logic based things mm -hmm. you could work out on pen and paper. And now the things, the techniques that seem to dominate are more statistical based, you know, showing, building representations, building a distribution of inputs or, you know, understanding something um, from a tremendous amount of data instead of from a more logical standpoint. I think that, um, but I don't, I don't think that these are so distinct, um, especially when you, when you use the more statistical things, you use them as a tool to build uh, symbolic understanding, then, then, you know, they can layer on top of each other, I guess would be a good way to put it. You, you've been working in Silicon Valley for a long time, and that's typically seen as kind of the uh, Garden Eden for, for innovation. But when you come here to Berlin, do you get to feel that there's a lot happening here as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm really passionate about that. I think that while Silicon Valley is, is, uh, is an amazing place, I mean, it's created so many of the things that not only we use, so much of the value in the world, but the things that have literally changed our lives. Um, really predominantly. And I would say those things that are about to change the lives of a bunch of people um, in the world who have not yet had access to technology. So that all those things are amazing and I have to credit that to, you know, this small peninsula of land uh, south of San Francisco. Um, I think though the word technology and the word startup and all of these things are uh, expanding. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, living in New York, I see a lot of businesses, I see a lot of young companies, a lot of innovative things happening. Um, that are more appropriate in New York because they touch industries uh, that are housed in New York because their customers are there, that type of thing. And same here in Berlin. I see you know, the European community coming together, um, people networking, people doing a lot of the things that make Silicon Valley what it is here in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the sort of way that uh, we do things at tech companies being more the way people do things all over the world. There's often this notion that in a connected world we just meet in cyberspace. We don't need to meet in real life. Yeah. Uh, is that true? Or why, why have these kinds of conferences at all? Well, I, I don't even remember how we met before some of the technologies. Like I had to ask someone, how did we meet before we had cell phones? Mm -hmm. I must have done it, but I don't even... So um, I think Here's the way I would say it. There's, technology is going to let us do a whole bunch of new things, um, but it's still up to us to figure out what those new things are. And so, uh, you know, Facebook specifically, I think it's a, an amazing tool for keeping up with people when you're looking at a screen and also coordinating, uh, meeting people in the real world and like keeping those, those types of connections alive. I don't think they, uh, I don't think one replaces the other. Uh, but I also think, you know, it's going to be people like here at Tala 16 uh, and what they build that determines um, what the future looks like. And that's more exciting. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for your interest.